Uh, look, I'd like to introduce Mr. Tim Colbatch. He is the economics editor of the Age newspaper, for which he has worked ever since graduating from the University of Melbourne, back in what he calls prehistoric times. He has previously been the Age's Washington correspondent, the economics writer, a, lead, a, a leader writer, head of the investigative unit and the environment writer as well. Tim grew up in Melbourne and has degrees in arts and commerce and in Asian studies from the ANU. The other two degrees are from the University of Melbourne. He now lives in Canberra where he works from the press gallery but also spends a lot of time in Melbourne. In his spare time he's writing a biography of former Victorian Premier Sir Rupert Dick Hamer. Tim has won numerous awards for his reporting and op-ed columns. I must admit I'm a keen reader of Tim's articles, as is Kerry and probably many of you in the room, and I always enjoy reading his articles because it lets me find out what is really going on. And uh, so he, he does the op-ed columns on economics and foreign policy issues, including the Melbourne Press Club... Uh, Sorry, he won the award for the Melbourne Press Club Quill Award for the best columnist in 2000. And in 2008, Tim was named recipient of the 2008 European Union Qantas Journalism Award by the National Press Club. So uh, we're very delighted to have you here, Tim. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, forget all your other titles. Uh, Surgeon General Professor, uh, and thank you Graduate Union for having me here. Um, this is not the first time I've been at the Graduate Union and certainly not the first time I and my family have uh, been at the University. My grandfather Walter Colbatch uh, first worked here in the first decade of the last century um, when he had a simultaneous appointment as veterinary officer for the Victorian Government and lecturer in veterinary science at the university. Um, my mother studied here in the 20s and 30s as one of the relatively small number of women on the campus, pursued by a much larger number of men, <laughs> and did degrees in arts and commerce, but then settled for being a housewife. My father did his postgrad MD here in the 1930s while he was uh, working at the Royal Melbourne. And, um, and then, of course, I went, he came here, and my siblings, or my father-in-law, Frank Tui, uh, also came here. So we have a long, my family has a long association with the university. And uh, my father had a particularly close association with Graduate House because he was a member of the Graduate Union in retirement for many years. He used to work at the Royal Children's Hospital as a specialist hematologist. And uh, when he retired from there, he used to come here because it was still in Parkville and he was used to kind of making the trip. And uh, so he was a regular at gradu graduate union lunches. And this is my second one, uh, second speech to the graduate union, third speech at Graduate House, because we also had my father's 90th birthday party here in those old higgledy piggledy rooms um, out the back of the terrace houses. And I spoke, I discovered during the course of researching this that I had spoken here almost exactly 15 years ago um, from the past to the future, Australia's economic transformation. <laughs> Addressed to the Graduate Union, University of Melbourne, 3rd of September 1998, during the middle of an election campaign. <laughs> so I thought I'd save time by just reading the same speech. <laughs> Except that time has sadly proved it wrong. <laughs> and uh, it's a great um, uh, reminder of the need to be humble about uh, one's ability to foresee things and to foresee the future, which shows I was completely mistaken to pick Australia's economic future as my topic, uh, because you should only stick to things you know about, and I don't know about the future. I know a lot more about the past. <laughs> and. I made the mistake in that speech of assuming that the past trends were going to be replicated in the future and reality proved otherwise. I pointed out in that speech, it was basically a plea for industry policy and it was well based on if you just went on 
the past experience because I pointed out that over that past 20 years at that time, there hadn't been much growth in demand for Australia's farm products or mineral exports. In fact, globally, mineral exports have grown just in volume just 2% a year for 20 years, whereas uh, manufactured exports demand was growing 6% a year. Over the 20 year period, agricultural mineral exports have increased 60%, but manufactured exports have increased 220%. That's all around the world, not just Australia. So I said we're in the wrong area. And uh, whereas the policymaker's solution to our high current account deficits was to make more of the things we typically sell, I argue that it was to make more of the things we typically buy. And I remind people that uh, back in the 60s, Holden at one stage was exporting 40,000 Holdens a year to Asia. That was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, well, you know, if you're all age readers, you know we have one of our most popular columns uh, is headed, We Were Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because the world changed in ways I did not predict, and I was not alone in that. The first big change has been in the pattern of global growth, and it was around about that time, actually, around about 1998, that a very dramatic change in the trajectory of developing, developing countries started to occur. In that previous year, we, those of us who cared about development economics and the, the blight of poor countries uh, despaired over the fact that the gaps were not closing. In 1982, the average income per head in developing countries was 11% of the average income in developed countries. In 1992, it was still 11%. In 2002, it had crept up to 12%. But now in 2012, it was 17%. And the IMF forecasts that in 2018, at the end of its forecast period, it'll be 20%. So what's happened? The, whereas developed and rich and poor countries were growing at the same pace uh, at the time I spoke here last, um, since then, their, their pace of growth has bifurcated significantly. Uh, the growth in developing countries has doubled, from almost doubled, from 3.8% to 6.6%, not quite doubled, uh, but risen hugely, from 3.8% a year to 6.6% a year. That is very rapid growth. And that's on average through the six plus billion people living in developing countries. It is a very good news story. Unfortunately, in advanced countries, it's been the opposite. As you know, we've had a global financial crisis uh, and their growth rate has halved from 3.2% in the previous 20 years to 1.6%. And at the moment, it's still puttering along that at that pace and not expected to do um, improve a lot in the near future because there are so many deep-seated problems. Uh, in the recent years, two-thirds of all global growth has come from developing countries. Some, some years, of course, more than 100% of it. 30% from China alone. 10% from India alone. And, but it's not just China and India, it's happening everywhere. If you look at the growth rates in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, in particular, Africa. Uh, they have it's grown enormously. They've, they've risen um, to a very, in a very large pace in ways that, that it was something that you would not have predicted from the patterns of 20 years ago. The past can be a dangerous guide. And uh, I apologise to any of you who were at that speech 15 years ago for so totally misleading you about the future um, because I didn't see that change happening. What is it? The secret is that they have got, they've started to learn and apply the lessons of economic growth, how to make their countries richer. It's no accident that it's gone hand in hand with the spread of democracy in the developing world as people's interests start to become predominant over those of the elites. Um, there is more attention paid to how people can be made better off and uh, economic growth has, has grown a lot. China, as I mentioned, is particularly crucial. 30% um, of global growth comes from China now. It is the world's biggest country in population. And uh, as Ross Gano, uh, now at the Melbourne Institute here, points out, China's growth over three decades has averaged 10% a year. 
it's just colossal. There has never been any country in history, not even Japan in its three years, grew at that pace, not even Korea. It's not only been the fastest growth in history, but it was also the most resource intensive growth in history. A lot of it went to building up industries like steel and aluminium, which by which China bought imports, raw materials from other countries, Australia, and transformed them into uh, girders, cars, all the various materials that went to power its urban development. How did that affect us? Hugely. Uh, it certainly ripped up my 1998 speech and turned it into confetti to accelerate the new mining boom in Australia, which was to dwarf anything we'd seen before, apart from the gold rush in the 1850s. It saw mineral prices rise so high that at their peak, Australia's terms of trade were higher than they even were during the Korean War boom of 1950-51, which was something we thought we would never see again, we economists. It took the dollar up above parity with the US dollar for two and a half years with a few breaks and made a lot of previously competitive industries in Australia uncompetitive. And the Reserve Bank and the government took no action to halt this rise uh, and protect the competitiveness of those industries because they were relying on the dollar's rise to keep inflation under control because they thought we were going to have a massive boom and that they needed to stop the pot from boiling over and having uh, a high dollar meant that import prices were falling and that would offset the growth that was coming from huge demand, which of course also proved to be a false prediction. Um, I just took out some interesting statistics on exports by industry, um, just to illustrate this change. Back in 1972, which I'm sure some of you remember at least, uh, 25% of Australia's exports came from mining, and that was, of course, at the end of that big mining boom of the 1960s. In 1997, when I gave the speech, that had barely changed, it was 28%. But in 2012, last year, 52% of our export income came from minerals. It's gone from being a quarter of our export income to just over half. Huge change. Where has it come from? Everything else has gone backwards in, in share. Rural, was 42% of Australia's exports back in 1972, fell to 20% by 2000, oh, sorry, 1997, 12% now. Services and manufacturing both rose in the years between 72 and 97, particularly during the Labor government of uh, Hawke, Keating and Button, uh, because they were putting a lot of emphasis on developing manufacturing and getting manufacturers and service industries to export to the new growth economies of Asia. Um, but that's fallen right back now. It's because the high dollar has made, simply made things uncompetitive. Uh, tourism has, to Australia has been falling for years. Um, our manufacturing exports have gone flat. So they're now, having gone from 27% of Australia's exports to 41%, they've gone, they're back at 27% now. Um, and in the last 10 years, our exports have risen 144 billion, of which 108 billion was mining exports. So it's it's just been it's been a one industry boom. It's had huge impacts at state level. Oh, let me just mention before I leave mining that there's still much more of that to go. Um, what we've had is in the last few years has been a mining boom, which as I say, there's been no precedent for since the gold rush. Mining investment used to make up 1 or 2% of Australia's gross domestic product. In the last year or so, depending on what your exact definition of the mining industry is, it's been around 7 or 8%. It's a huge increase from the plateau it had been at before and makes all the previous booms look like just little hills. Uh, every previous boom has ended in a bust. Uh, not just in mining export, in mining investment, but in investment for the economy generally and in the uh, and in GDP. Um, the, we don't know exactly what lies ahead because projects are being cancelled at an extraordinary rate. There's hardly a week goes by without mining projects being cancelled. Those of you who read the financial press will know. Um, and I think the last roundup by the Bureau of Resource and Energy Economics 
noted that more than 100 billion of projects have been cancelled or postponed since it last reported. That's a lot of money. But there still are a lot of big projects on the grid, with some of them already underway, in particular nine big gas projects off the northwest shelf, which have a combined value of 150 to 200 billion. It keeps changing all the time because the costs keep rising. Um, and those are expected to go ahead regardless of all the other cancellations and keep mining exports from falling precipitously as they have in the past, because in the past it's always been like that. They've always gone down a cliff. Uh, this time the authorities are hopeful. I won't say, like six months ago I would have said confident. I will now say hopeful because they're no longer so confident. But hopeful that these mining, these gas projects will be completed and they will keep mining investment from falling too precipitously because of the did, going from you know seven and a half percent of GDP back to about one percent or one and a half, that would put Australia into a recession. And no one wants to see that. Um, the good news coming out of the mining industry is that whereas while mining investment is falling, mining exports are rising rapidly. They are up 11% in the year to March, and the Bureau of Resource and Energy Economics, which is the government's forecaster, it used to be called ABEAR, it just keeps changing its name, uh, they project real growth of 5% a year of mining exports into the future. And that's a lot when you've got mining exports already making up half our uh, exports, 10% of Australia's GDP, um, to have that growing at 5% a year is pretty helpful. But it's had a huge impact at state level because this investment, of course, has been very concentrated in outback mines and even offshore projects. Uh, it's been concentrated in WA and in remote areas of Queensland. The bust, the bad news from the uh, high dollar, impact of the high dollar making other industries uncompetitive, has been concentrated in the southeast and particularly here. And, uh, the exports data I, I took out illustrates this very starkly. Um, between two, in 2012, Victoria contributed 18% of Australia's export income. In 2012, 10 years later, that was 11%. Western Australia, by contrast, had 22% uh, of Australia's export income in 2002, about the same as Victoria. Now it's 40%. So a very dramatic shift has the balance of economic power in the Federation has changed dramatically. Uh, the growth prospects of different parts of Australia have become very uneven. And I kept saying over the last two or three years, it is very difficult to talk about an Australian economy because we don't have one. We've got two separate economies, the resource states, which are booming, and the non-resource states, which are going bust. Um, oh yeah, in absolute billions of dollars uh, between 2002 and 2012. Australia's export income rose by about 144 billion, of which 85 billion was in w from WA alone, 5 billion from Victoria. And where did that go? Well, um, I mentioned China. Uh, back in 2002, 2012, um, Europe the US and New Zealand between them took 30% of our exports. That's now down to 18%. A very dramatic fall. China in 2002 took 10% of our exports. That's now 30%. Huge. A degree of export reliance on China is slightly worrying if China runs into trouble. And that's one of the, the future issues I'll come to later. There's also been big increases in uh, India, but from a much smaller base, exports to India from a much smaller base. And that goes back to what Gano was saying about the China's resources, the resource intensity of China's development has been the most uh, striking in, in any country's development history. No other country has consumed resources uh, in relation to GDP at the rate China has in the last few years. Now China has, as you know, set out on a, to change that pattern of growth. Its le new leaders have said they want slower growth, 7.5% or so. Um, some people doubt they'll even get that. They want to make it harder for, whereas a lot of these 
resource intensive projects had been built with money borrowed from the banks because the banks in China borrow, they lend rather on political grounds. They are told to lend to a certain company or lend to this local government to build things. You've probably all seen on the TV news the footage of these uh, phantom cities, ghost cities that China built in 2009-10. Uh, an awful lot of Australian iron ore and coal to build those uh, places, so we, we should welcome it, but it's, uh, it's a big burden for their economy to bear because no one gets money from those ghost cities to pay the interest bills. And uh, China has already gone through one huge problem in the past in trying to drive off the debts of uncompetitive state-owned enterprises and local governments, and almost certainly it is facing another one now, and, but at a much higher level, because huge debts were run up during the uh, China's boom, the last few years of China's boom, by local governments and state-owned enterprises which do not have the capacity to repay them. And the Chinese government uh, does have huge assets, particularly in foreign exchange, uh, which it could use to repay them, but to do that would involve taking out uh, the prop by which it keeps its currency low. Because whereas Australia has adopted the gospel of allowing its exchange rate to float freely and therefore be fairly unpredictable, uh, the Chinese and in fact virtually all Asian governments adopt totally the opposite policy and try and retain a kind of parity with the US dollar. They try and maintain a kind of fixed exchange rate with the US dollar so that their businesses know what they're going to get and also to keep their currency at a low value and prevent it from appreciating and making their industries uncompetitive. Well, what's the future then? The question is, will it be the same as the past? This was a mistake I made, of course, uh, 15 years ago. Will I make the same mistake? No, I will not. I will <laughs> retain, I will stay on the sidelines of this argument. But the three key points, I'll just leave you with this. Uh, will the developing countries keep growing at this rate, or for that matter, even faster, or will they come unstuck? Uh, the general consensus is that they will keep growing at this rate, that the lessons of economic growth have been learnt and will continue to be applied, that they have enormous ground to catch up. It's much easier to catch up to what other people are doing than to be a pioneer uh, innovating new ways of doing things. And so their task is a lot easier than those of us who are rich countries. And on the other hand, each of them has vulnerabilities. I think of Indonesia, which is the developing country I know best. And it's been tremendously impressive, Indonesia's uh, democratic transition in the last 15 years, um, where democracy seems, you know, from having been a dictatorship for all its life virtually, Indonesia has now become a, a really vibrant democracy. But at the same time, it's a fragile one. And you can easily see Indonesia going backwards and sliding back both uh, in political terms and in economic terms uh, from the, the rapid growth it's, it's been experiencing in recent years. Same in India. India has, even in good years, the Indian government has continued running up massive bet deficits, uh, which are going to create serious problems if it ever has to repay that money. Uh, and growth in India is still very much concentrated in the coastal cities and not in the hinterland of, of rural farms. China, uh, as I mentioned, has huge problems with its uh, hanging over its head with the shadow banking and uh, the loans to uh, government and semi-government bodies who can't repay them. Nigeria is a classic example in Africa. Nigeria is, of course, the, the most populous country in Africa, something like 170 billion people now. Sorry, million people. So, <laughs> you keep making that mistake as economics, right? I'd like to shoot the person who invented the words million and billion because they are so easy to confuse. Um, but I mean, Nigeria has had massive growth in recent years. It's growing at about 8% a year uh, as its oil industry develops and its uh, infrastructure and its towns and all sorts of things are really... Nigeria is a classic example of a developing country that is, seems to have hit the fast fast growth lane. Uh, but then you, you look at all the 
civic turmoil in Nigeria, all its different groups, the um, absence of acceptable agreement on the you know, rules of the game and power sharing. And, and Nigeria could also go backwards. And, uh, and the same is true of lots of countries. So that's one question. I, the, I say the consensus is that they will keep growing and that will be good for uh, our export demand and for the world economy. Secondly, will new mines spring up elsewhere to bring down mineral prices or will future d demand be less resource intensive in the past? In other words, Australia has now pretty much put its eggs in one basket of, of mining. We've allowed the manufacturing sector to wind down. The growth that uh, was happening in those labour years of the Hawke and Keating governments has now well and truly reversed. Um, and when you lose these industries, they don't come back. If we lose the car industry, as we, we've lost most of it really now. Uh, if we lose the rest of it, it won't come back. No one's going to sort of set up plants to build cars in Australia anymore. And that's something that you know, five billion a year of production that we're going to have to import in future. Uh, and it's Gano's view, and he knows more about this than I do, so I pass it on as probably the most valuable thing I can say, <laughs> uh, is that no other country will have the kind of development that China has, the level of resource intensiveness. For one thing, the concern about uh, global warming is increasing, not just here, well, certainly not here, actually. It's going backwards here. Uh, but not just in Western countries. It's, it's in increasing around the world. China has started the first of its emission trading schemes in the pilot project, uh, and it will have nine pilot projects going within the next two years. Um, countries are realising that global warming is going to hit them uh, with very unpredictable impacts, and this will make them more careful about what they, how they generate electricity, uh, coal doesn't face the future it appeared to face 10 years ago or five years ago uh, and also just the way that they the kind of industries they develop and thirdly there's the question of Australia's own vulnerabilities will they overwhelm us now our, our vulnerabilities are not government debt despite all the efforts to persuade us that they are it doesn't actually matter having yes we're going to have 300 billion of um, general government debt by the end of the year, but as a share of uh, GDP, which is 1,500 billion, uh, that is really still pretty small. So it's 20%. Uh, we used to have vastly, we've gone through years, decades, with vastly bigger debt than that. And other countries in the world, uh, most other Western countries have vastly bigger debt. That's not the problem. The real problem in Australia is private debt. That over the 890s and uh, noughties, if I can call them that, um, households took on an awful lot of debt to buy houses, mainly to buy houses, sometimes to invest in the stock market or to invest in other things, but it was basically about borrowing money to invest in house prices and the more we borrowed and the more we invested, the more the prices rose, so it became a cat chasing its own tail and uh, people had to, since people have to sell in the same market that they buy or buy in the same market that they sell, no one actually gets better off apart from the real estate agents and the bankers. Um, that reached our private debt to, as a share of household income was 30% uh, at the start of the 80s. It reached 150% by 2007 when it has plateaued. And the rise of the cautious consumer, as we have tended to call them, since then has been due to the fact that uh, households don't want to go into debt any further. And that's a very good thing, really, for the long-term sustainability of growth in the economy. That's excellent. Um, but it does mean we've got far less demand for um, people buying things, which is one of the reasons why retailing is doing so badly. It's been doing so badly since the GFC. And it's forecast to go on that way for more or less internally, because we haven't actually reduced our debt very much, but we just we don't want to increase it any further. And if you look at other countries, Western countries, that's about as, as big as they get. And the last risk, of course, is that, uh, as I mentioned, all our eggs are, are still in the one basket. And uh, it'll mean that we're more volatile, depending on what happens to the demand for our minerals. When, they, when the minerals are going well, Australia will be booming. 
where minerals are not doing well globally, Australia will be lagging behind. Um, so that's my best guess about the future, and I hope it's a best, better guess than the last one was. <laughs> For those who didn't hear, the question was whether we are getting the maximum value out of our minerals exports and whether we should be looking at firstly the question of ownership of them and ensuring that they're Australian owned or more Australian owned and secondly whether we should be adding value to them by manufacturing and processing the materials here rather than sending them out in raw shape to be processed <coughs> elsewhere. Uh, the problem with that is that um, but just on the, the ownership issue, um, mining is roughly 80% foreign owned uh, in Australia now. Even those we think of as Australian mining companies like BHP and Rio Tinto are basically foreign owned. And the same is true for practically any large Australian mining company these days. Um, could, should we change that? I don't think so, to be honest. I think it's good having a free flow of capital, by and large. And uh, yes, it means we don't get the maximum value, but it also means we don't take the risks in what is a rather volatile industry. So um, that, of all the things that worry me, that's not one of them, I've got to say. Uh, and in terms of the manufacturing, I think if you have a dollar at our level, um, then it's really not practical to try and insist that companies do their processing, resource processing here. Uh, if we had a policy which ensured a lower currency that made us more competitive in manufacturing, then it would become less of a burden to companies. But I think at the moment it's, it's a little bit like the Indonesians have um, adopted a policy like that, of saying that resources uh, have to be processed in Indonesia. But even resource processing is very capital intensive and Indonesia is a labour intensive country. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't actually have a lot of capital, uh, whereas it does have a lot of spare labour. Um, and these projects don't afford much labour. So um, it probably makes more sense in Australia than it does in Indonesia. But I think, to be honest, I've, I've felt just leave it as it is. Um, we've seen the interest rates go down quite dramatically and there's even talk of zero interest rates. Uh, that's good for the householder and the industry, but not so good for the elderly person, living off uh, interest and investment. Do you think that this loss of disposable income will affect the economy in any significant way? Um. No, it won't because the gains to borrowers far outweigh the losses to savers. So, so that was the question for those who didn't hear. Would the, uh, the questioner pointed out that uh, while many people were cheering the fall in interest rates for elderly people with savings, it's uh, a very negative development because it means they get less income. Um, but and will this affect, he asked, will this affect the economy as a whole? Um, it won't affect it in a negative way because, as I say, we, uh, we owe far more than we have deposited in the banks. And uh, so that the losses to investors like, the savers like yourself, uh, are outweighed by the gains to the people with mortgages. Um, Sorry, it wasn't at the point I was going to make, but I've now forgotten what it was. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, oh yes, you mentioned that you, you'd heard it was going to go, it might go down to zero. I don't think there's any risk, whatever, of Australian interest rates going to zero. And I will 
make a forecast about that <laughs> and prepare to be pilloried in 15 years' time if I've got it wrong. In a first world economy like ours, is growth always a good thing? Uh, not growth at any cost. Is growth always a good thing? Uh, yeah, in a first world economy like ours, is growth always a good thing? Um, well, growth at any cost is not a good thing. There are certainly, um, if you build something that's going to lose you money, for example, it doesn't seem to be a good thing. If you, China is discovering in a different way that not all growth is good because it's people can't breathe anymore in the cities. They have to go out and wear gas masks uh, to cope with the amount of pollutants and little these tiny particles that are in the air uh, spewed out by industrial um, factory smokestacks in China. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, growth is not always a good thing, but I think... It seems to be what we're aiming for all the time. Yeah. And how we evaluate ourselves. Well, it's got to be ecologically sustainable. It's got to be as well as economically sustainable. And, uh, and also, of course, you want the question of distribution of that growth comes up. You mm -hmm. want growth to be distributed fairly, and we all have different ideas of what fairness means in this context. But uh, I don't see any sign that people want lesser things, I've got to say. Yes, is there a future for Is there a future for Australian business in making small parts, components of cars and aeroplanes and that sort of thing? Um, you there is if you have tied up your buyers. You have to have a, agreements with the prospective purchasers uh, to get the volume of production that's going to make it worthwhile here rather than in some low wage country. Unless it's an Australia, if it's if there's an Australian invention where we have rights over it, then that changes the story because that makes it uh, <coughs> sensible to make them here. Uh, <clears throat> but if it's something that can be made anywhere in the world, why would you make it in Australia, which is a high wage economy, rather than in somewhere their wages are much lower? Difficult question. Should we be making cars in this country when it's cheaper to buy them from overseas? Um, whether it's cheaper to buy them from overseas depends on the exchange rate, and I've uh, gone into that uh, in my speech. Uh, Ten years ago, the Australian dollar was a little over 50 US cents, and uh, Holden and Falcon were pretty cheap by world standards. They, could, they were able to compete very very well with the overseas companies, uh, overseas made cars, not with Hyundai's maybe, but uh, you know the Japanese cars for example, because uh, our dollar was low. Now if you change the price of the dollar, that completely changes the price of the cars. And that's been a huge burden on the Australian car makers over recent years. Um, secondly, we've had a shift from passenger cars. Passenger cars used to be the dominant things people bought. Now, more than half the vehicles sold in Australia are not passenger cars, they are mostly SUVs, four-wheel drive, those big tanks, the rhinoceroses as I think of them, um, <laughs> that go charging around. Um, and only one of those is made in Australia, the Ford Territory. So we, our local subsidiaries, which are all just subsidiaries of overseas car makers, they lost out badly in the allocation of these things. Um, if Holden went or to Toyota went now, I think that would be very damaging to uh, cities like Melbourne and Adelaide and Geelong. There's no two, well, Geelong is going to suffer from Ford going, uh, but Melbourne and Adelaide will suffer considerably if the car industry shuts down because it employs even now 40 to 50,000 people and uh, produces $5 billion of output. Maybe 
Much was made quite a while ago now about Australia's attraction for um, corporate base being stable politically, relatively well educated, um, and in the Asian Pacific region. Uh, what was the strength of that? What is it now, and what do you see for the future? Right. Uh, probably everybody heard that question. It's about the uh, attractions of Australia as a corporate base, which used to be touted as because of our uh, stable economy, stable political system, and uh, being in the same time zone as Asian countries. What's happened to it? Uh, it's fallen the same way as anything else that depends on having a, an attractive currency. Uh, it's no, com no companies are setting up in Australia. Uh, well, not none, but the very few companies are setting up regional bases in Australia because it's just a very expensive place to do business because we have allowed the dollar to get out of, so far out of its historic average. Its historic average used to be 70 US cents. Now we're cheering the fact that it's come down to 89. Um, you know, we are, we are still a pretty uncompetitive place to do business and uh, I, until that changes, I can't see us get attracting very many corporate headquarters or branch offices. Yes, uh, biomedical sciences and biotechnology can, can have the potential to bring great rewards to society but also economically to Australia, but yet we, we seem to be putting all our eggs in one basket of mining, pulling minerals out of the ground. So what's your thoughts about Australia spending more of its GDP on biomedical research, biotechnology, when we compare ourselves to countries like Singapore, uh, Sweden, USA, Israel, where, where we seem to be way behind there. Should we not catch up? Right. Did everyone hear that question? I think so, yeah. You know? All right, okay. The question um, Jeffrey asked was, um, what are we doing, or why, don't, why aren't we doing more, rather, to develop our biomedical <coughs> sciences uh, and the research capacity and industrial capacity as countries like Singapore and Israel are doing, uh, rather than putting all our eggs in the minerals basket. Um, I can't agree more. I can't agree more. But uh, the problem again there is is that how would you go about making that policy work? Well, the first thing you'd have to do is to try and control the currency. Frankly, it's you cannot do that sort of thing if you allow your currency to become uncompetitive with the world. And the attitude of the policy makers is that we don't need industries like that because we have enough minerals to sell to the world. We don't need to sell other things. And uh, anything else will just get in the way of mining. And we have so many minerals. And if you look far enough ahead, minerals are going to become scarce and don't make them anymore. Um, so, uh, their price will rise in future and uh, to try and develop manufacturing industries or science-based industries in Australia is uh, may make us feel good but it's a economically a waste of time. That's the hard-nosed economic rationalist view which predominates in policy circles. Um, again, I can come to the dollar. Um, but yeah, you look at what Singapore is doing and they've attracted, of course, many Australian researchers, Alan Trounson and, and others. Uh, to go over there and set up because they provide huge, it's a totally different way of running economic policy and it's worth noting that Singapore is now one of the richest economies in the world. I mean if you take, it's, it's, it's a bit inflated because they have low company tax and therefore a lot of company profit is washed through Singapore. But Singapore has, has gone from being a pretty poor Asian country years ago to becoming one of the very richest countries in the world, certainly richer than Australia. And it's done it by breaking all the rules of good economic policy as taught here. Ladies <laughs> 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 and gentlemen, I'm, I'm mindful of Jim's uh, stamina. Uh, and there are many other hands on sea up in here, but for some time I've seen Bruce and Reese over there. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to just limit it to those two questions, and, and then if other people like to sort of ask 10 questions, maybe you could um, do that personally if he has time after the dinner. Well, so, um, Bruce, uh, sorry, um, George, uh, Yeah, please? thank you very much. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. In fact, I do apologise. I think you're about 10 years too late. <laughs>
Because one of the things you never touched up on in your talk is the um, technology aspect. You never mentioned 3D printing. You never mentioned where labor costs at the moment are exported to the third world countries and therefore you have China, Indonesia and so on, cheap labor costs and therefore manufacturing and therefore exporting. But 3D printing has the ability to set up within Australia or any sort of Western world country to manufacture all the car parts, all the sort of um, bones that we need to graft on people and so on um, <laughs> that we need. But I was surprised you never mentioned that, you see. Um, uh, the other thing with regards to um, the previous speaker about biotechnology, Resmet, for example, is being copied by China now. So everybody is worried about the product that will be produced from China at a cheaper rate. We have mesoplast with uh, all the stem cells and so on that's coming through. Uh, we live in a very world uh, economy and everyone's got their hands on all these things. But I think where our future lies, not in mining, because over the last 10 years, $192 billion have been collected by government and 185 have been spent on marginal seats and tax cuts. <laughs> so they didn't do anything with that, you see. Um, and also, um, manufacturing... I don't accept those figures, by the way. Pardon? I don't accept those figures. Yeah. Okay. Um, be it as it may, I spoke to Tim Fisher the other day because I had lunch with him. And he was talking about all these sort of infrastructure railways. And I said to him, wait a minute, you presided over 10 years of all this mining industry, economic activity, why didn't you do anything about the trains? Uh, and he avoided the question totally. So, uh, so there was no infrastructure development during all these lucrative years. Could you come to the point of the question? Yeah, the, the point of the question is where our future lies in being entrepreneurs and developing new technology in manufacturing. Um, our future doesn't rely on just digging up and selling the minerals. Uh, because if you see our most lucrative partner, China, and the iron ore, they, in the city of Tianjin at the moment, they're going to build these huge towers with office space more than Sydney. But the problem is Chinese middle class um, is Sorry, investing in non-productive assets. So therefore, Sorry, our future... Our, yeah, well, our future lies, which you didn't touch upon, on technology and also on being entrepreneurs in, in setting up the pace rather than anything else. Well, this sounds like a very interesting speech for another graduate year. <laughs> 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 right, thank you very much for saying, George. The last question, please, is Bruce. Thank well, you. Thank you, Tim. Tim, I, I listen with interest the, uh, the growth rates you quoted in Western Australia, and uh, one, one's tempted to think we probably should have relocated the college there at some stage. But uh, I was at a conference a couple of years ago in Taiwan, and uh, one of the speakers said that manufacturing is still considered to be one of the greatest value and activities there is. And yet, we seem to have this dilemma in Australia because of the high dollar. Uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, we've consistently run down our manufacturing capacity. And, um, and I listened with interest to your comments about the motor vehicle industry being one, that, that once we lose that capacity, the barriers to entry as, are as such that it would be very difficult to retain that. And there's another area that seems to get very little coverage is that over recent years we seem to be dismantling our refining capacity in this country, and uh, I believe the Canal refinery has been closed down, uh, there's talk of the Geelong refinery becoming a terminal, and, but at the same time I think PRA has refurbished their plant. Now, when we've got a high dollar, that's all very well, because it's imports are cheap. But if we reflect back on the long-term average of the dollar, that I think you quoted at 70 cents, one wonders where the country will be if we do at some stage return back to that long-term average after we've dismantled some of this manufacturing capacity and our refining capacity. And the car industry and the refining industries, in the old thinking, used to be considered to be a critical industry. So, do you have a comment on uh, what yeah, the impacts well, on the economy might be if we go down that track? Yeah, well, it, it means there's just something else that we have to buy and we have to pay for it, I guess, given the choices we've made, we'll have to pay for it by shipping out more minerals. Um, 
Taiwan is a great contrast to Australia because their two economies are roughly the same size, populations roughly the same size, GDP per head roughly the same. Uh, but if you go to Taiwan, you see people live very much worse than they do here. Um, whereas, but they invest a lot. They keep their dollar down to make it all, make it very cheap for manufacturers to produce in Taiwan. They have a goal of keeping manufacturing at something like 25% of their output, as against about 8% now in Australia. Very sharp difference. Uh, where will we buy our, or where will we? Refine our oil in future in Singapore. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, yeah, no, it's it's just a um, refining capacity is being allowed to wind down, and uh, it will eventually disappear. Thank you, Jim. It's your turn to sit down. Then. <laughs>